Hi, I'm Pat Cohn, and this is the November 26th or 25th, I guess, depending on yeah, how you think about, uh, about midnight, as uh, uh, edition of my vlog. And I guess that's an interesting topic to open with. It's different cultures seem to have uh, seem to have different ideas of when a day begins and ends, and for some cultures, it uh, the new day begins at sundown. I'm guessing that there are some cultures where the new day is considered to begin at sunrise. Um, it's interesting that we've decided that the turnover point is so far, uh, so distant from uh, from each. Uh, midnight is actually I don't think it's really the middle of the night. Um, I mean, what would that mean? I guess it would mean that at six p.m. the the there would be an equal amount of light as six a.m. But I don't, well, I, I mean, I guess living in the northern hemisphere, maybe, maybe my, my perspective is skewed here, and near the equator, 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. actually do have an equivalent amount of light. If that were the case, then maybe placing midnight at, uh, at the time that it does makes sense. And I guess it, it is the opposite of, of noon, which uh, I think is relatively non-controversially supposed to be. Uh, when the when the sun is closest to being directly over hood, uh, overhead as as it'll be, but I'm not sure if that's a um, oh shoot one of my cats is bothering the other cat. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. So uh, never mind that. Um, but yeah, in, in any case, I'm recording this a little bit after midnight uh, on I guess what what should be. By, by the way that we normally account for time as the 26th. Um, although I guess just by convention I normally think of time as being the day really ends when I go to sleep and begins when I wake up, but that does assume a relatively normal sleep schedule. Not all of us uh, actually keep that. I, I don't always keep that. Um, it's been a while since I did, uh, did my last vlog. I guess the last one was on 17th of August so uh, yeah, that was um, that a little bit over three months ago, and a reasonable number of things have changed in the last few, uh, three months. Um, most recently, I ordered the Nexus Nine, uh, which is a, a new Nexus tablet, and I was holding off on getting it until I could order a uh, the keyboard case that uh, that's uh, that's an option for it. It's a case that pairs with the tablet uh, via Bluetooth, and and I mean, it, as as any case would, it protects the device, but it also um, lets you type, which effectively changes the class of device that the tablet is. You might be able to use it essentially as a small uh, as a small laptop, and that that has a uh, that has an appeal. I mean, I, I'd like to be able to. Uh, I'd like to have a, a, a somewhat bigger tablet for watching movies. Uh, probably copy a lot of Hitchcock films onto it, stuff like that. But um, being able to type on the device is a major plus. Uh, another big change that uh, that I've uh, that's happened in my computing uh, life. Uh, uh, recently has been uh, Google Inbox, which is a alternative in, uh, interface to Google Mail, which is pretty cool. Um, it takes a major investment in time to really uh, make the most use of it, and that you're going to want to label things and set up uh, filters to label things for you. But it bundles together all the stuff that you have labeled, and and those bundles, the, the one that has the most recent email, they're, they're sorted by which bundle has the most recent email. So let's say you have a bundle called medical, you might have a bundle called apartment stuff, you might have all sorts of uh, bundles, and whenever a new mail comes in that gets filtered into one of the bundles, uh, that bundle goes to the top in the sorting order. But you kind of see a, uh, the last few messages in the bundle in the bundle summary. And so your inbox changes from being just a, a raw list of messages into things sorted by this bundle, uh, by these bundles, which is pretty cool. Since if you define your bundles and if you have a good 
organizational scheme, you're really going to have a good way to um, to manage your, your emails. So that's exciting and interesting, and I'm using it for my Gmail, which is one of my two personal email accounts. I also have uh, my, uh, my uh, account on my vanity domain, which I've had forever, and it's not going to go away. But uh, I guess with, with Inbox, you also get a little bit more integration with uh, like Inbox will try and figure out with purchases you made, it'll try and figure out tracking information, it'll extract that from the email. If you're on Meetup, I think it'll do some calendary things and maybe integrate with Google Maps and Google Now to tell you uh, like wh where you need to go for events that you've signed up for. Uh, stuff like that. It's it's neat to have, have that extended integration um, stuff going on. And so I used uh, my Gmail account for that. And now that I have uh, Inbox, it's a little bit smarter about that stuff. I um, forgot how I got onto this topic. Uh, Game-wise, I've been enjoying uh, Final Fantasy uh, V, I think. Yeah, which came out for Android. Done a little bit of, of playing of the old Dragon Warrior games, which was kind of nice. Um, Although, really, I, I only played the first three, um, and the third one was definitely the, uh, the best of the early Dragon Warriors, and it's not out yet for, uh, for Android, but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Civilization Beyond Earth, I'm waiting for the Linux port, and that probably means that I'm going to need to order a Linux workstation soon. It's not, uh, the game isn't out yet, but it'll be out soon. And right now, I have an older Linux laptop, uh, and the laptop is dying, so it, it never travels anymore. It just sits on my computer desk, hooked up to a big monitor. Um, and I kind of have to treat it delicately. I would like to move to having a, a more permanent, proper desktop um, there. So I, I probably should order one of those soon, at least a little bit before... Um, a little bit before it comes out for, uh, or before uh, Civilization Beyond Earth comes out for Linux, since it would be kind of silly to get a new game and not be able to play it uh, for a while until the hardware arrives. Um, and uh, So there's also a, uh, a remake of The Binding of Isaac, which is a fun game on Steam that I've, I've enjoyed. Um, the the uh, original version was done in Flash, and the most recent version, I'm, uh, it seems to be done using some uh, different uh, gaming toolkit. Maybe, it might be SDL. It, it has kind of the feel of an SDL app, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, not, a lot else, not a lot else going on with, uh, with gaming. Uh, with work, yeah, I, I guess it doesn't really make sense to talk about work with these things. Um, it's kind of nice not to have... Uh, too close of a tie between what one does professionally and one's personal life. Uh, but I, I guess it probably isn't too much to say that I've been burning the midnight oil a little bit too much for work, and uh, that and some other things with work have been kind of stressful. Um, but I don't know. It's generally, when you when you see a problem with work, you take steps to resolve it, and I uh, hope, hope that those steps are successful. Um, uh, News-wise, it's been interesting seeing the, the the tail end of of the current presidency and the political steps taken in that. Um, there was an election, and unfortunately, the uh, the conservatives won big on this one. And it looks like they're going to control uh, both houses of Congress uh, soon. Uh, from what I understand, so National Review, it's considered to be one of the um, one of the magazines that unites conservatives in the United States. Uh, and they're they're basically they're advising the Democrat or uh, the Republicans in Congress not to attempt to really pass any legislation and just uh, do nothing until. Uh, until the next presidential uh, race, which is 
not really surprising, although it's uh, at least as advice. It's interesting to see that advice happening out in, in the uh, daylight, though. Um, it seems like one of the more maybe excessively cynic uh, cynical and uh, maybe a little bit too honest to happen in public, but I guess that's a feature of, of our political system and that uh, a lot of stuff happens above, uh, above board in our political system that would be happening under the covers uh, in, um, in other political systems. Film-wise, I've still been enjoying uh, seeing a lot of Rift, tra uh, Rift, Tracks, uh, uh, Rift Tracks live events. There's another one coming up uh, near the beginning of December, um, uh, which is, uh, I think it's a Mexican Santa film which looks utterly ridiculous. The last one I saw, I think, was Anaconda, which I had forgotten how bad a film that was. I mean, wow, that was a terrible film. Um, and I also saw uh, Rosewater, which was a film by Jon Stewart, and um, I was initially... Uh, it seemed like my attempt to watch that film was... Uh, was the least success, was the least happy resolution of a lot of coincidences. I didn't get to see it in the theater I wanted. Most of the seats I wanted were blocked off, so I had to sit like in the in the second row and kind of look up at it. it turned out to be a really good film, and then much to my surprise, uh, John Stewart and um, Stephen Colbert, and uh, and and the some of the people involved in the film actually just came and plopped down right in front of the theater. Uh, or like right in the front row on a couch that some people brought in and talked about the film uh, for about an hour, which was pretty cool. And I guess in the end I was glad that it was in that theater and I was glad that I did have to sit near the front. Wasn't exactly, uh, these weren't exactly things that I chose, but they turned out actually for the best, despite them being really not what I, I wanted or expected. Uh, and that seems to be an, it's to theme in life. Sometimes you really think that something is is going to suck, or you make great efforts to prevent something from coming about in a certain way, and it turns out to actually be exactly what you needed. And that's, I mean, it's it's some it's a little bit humbling because I, I guess. When we try and t take responsibility for our lives, we think that this idea of agency and choice, that they're so important. And in a lot of areas of life, they are, um, at least for a lot of the really big stuff. But, but they aren't always. And there are often times in life when we really aren't good at figuring out what we want. Uh, what we think we want turns out to be really bad for us, or or there are some seriously awesome things hidden away and stuff that we've just trained our eye not to focus on. And so sometimes uh, we, we have these humbling moments where uh, what seemed like a negative surprise turns into something pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, kind of the, the way that, uh, that my last job ended, uh, it wasn't exactly a happy, uh, happy end, but it turned out to actually be quite awesome. Uh, or the, the whole the, the whole effect of it, um, and so that's this is just another example of that. Um, I guess maybe leaving Pittsburgh in some ways was like that too, but it, it wasn't exactly an involuntary le uh, leaving, and it was something that I was thinking about uh, anyhow. Um, I mean, and one of the other things I've been thinking about recently is this this idea that career-wise, just as, as a matter of security, it makes sense to have a lot of skills, a lot of marketable skills that might qualify one for many different fields or many different particular jobs. That's really nice when, uh, when you're in a tight spot or just when, when you feel like you're being uh, squeezed by your finances or squeezed by, by a number of uh, other things. You might do things that might not be the openest of choices. Uh, but it's nice to have those options open because it can stop you from making really true desperation choices. 
if if you if you can be fully qualified for for three jobs, five jobs, distinct jobs, I mean, uh, that that's a good thing. But you don't necessarily once the emergency has passed or or the time of being squozen has passed, you don't necessarily want to stay in that emergency mode. It makes sense to shift towards things that will actually make you happy. And I, I've known a, a number of artists who have had to deal with this, like they might have some semi-marketable skills, a whole bunch of them, and so they'll, they'll take a job and it'll pay the bills, their finances will recover from whatever it is, but they'll, they'll always be looking for something more close to being a perfect fit. And a lot of parts of life are like that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's great to have to have diverse job skills. It's great to have diverse various skills. Uh, but to be happy, you don't necessarily need to have those that diversity of skills. You just need to be in the right position to, to, uh, to have something that suits you perfectly. And this is probably true for, for romance as well. It's probably true for friendships as well. Like, it's probably good to have the skills to keep a good variety of friends in your life. I've never been good at that. I've never had many friends. Um, I am not outgoing. I don't really tend to talk to people that I don't know. And depression often leads my friendships to attenuate. It sucks. Uh, but the happiest times in life uh, for me haven't been when I've had lots of friends. They've been when I've had the right circle of friends, like the five or six right people in my life. And, and yeah, that, that's, it's another form of, of this diversity is great, uh, personal diversity and flexibility and, and all that stuff. But that's really more of a tide you through the rough times thing than a, a, a permanent thing. Um, so reading wise, right now I'm I'm working on a uh, on a Stephen King book. Uh, I don't remember the name of it because unfortunately it has a date. That's the title. Um, it's a time travel uh, book, and I, I haven't really known Stephen King to do a lot of time travel uh, with his with his works. I mean, I guess there was a little bit of it in the Dark Tower series, but it wasn't really time travel per se. Um, I'm enjoying it. it. It doesn't really feel like Stephen King's normal fare, uh, and it doesn't really feel like the fantasy type of novel that either The Dark Tower is or uh, The Talisman uh, is. But it's it's interesting. I like the characters. I'm enjoying the development of the book, and I'm curious to see how it'll work out. I'm, I'm about two-thirds of, of the way through. Um, and I've also been doing some reading for work. Uh, at work, there's a C++ reading group that I'm enjoying. There's also a, uh, a another reading group that's for uh, more random, interesting books. And uh, one of the books, uh, the, the most recent book that, that I read, uh, it's talking about the fundamental con uh, constants. And it has kind of an irritating format. It has... Uh, Newton, uh, Einstein, and I think Halder. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of like a, a fanfic where one imagines that they're all interacting with each other as they wander around California or something like that. But they talk about physics and they chat about things which I'm hoping are accurate. Because I, there's always that, that question when you're reading a popular science book how many of the conclusions and ideas from that are you actually going to use to update your current understanding of the sciences? And there's a certain amount of trust in that because uh, I don't have the expertise to really vet uh, to vet papers or or writings on uh, on on physics, uh, or certainly not astrophysics uh, or fundament, uh, fundamental physics. So I just kind of have to trust, or have to figure out when to trust something that seems academic-ish, uh, and figure out, like, is this likely to be done by people who actually know what they're talking about and who are tracking established research, people who have their reputation on the line, 
uh, and are part of a community where having your reputation on the line actually exposes you to criticism if uh, if the people who count, that is the academics working in the field, uh, in the relevant field, will they criticize you if you get it wrong? That's important. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this actually is, uh, it's uh, actually presenting relatively current scientific consensus on various uh, areas of physics. I don't know that for sure. So I'm going to put a certain amount of trust in it. But yeah, I finished that uh, for the upcoming uh, uh, the upcoming instance of that uh, read, uh, reading club, and I think it, it's going to meet on on the first of December. And yeah, we're we're winding down the year, uh, in in the sense that uh, holidays are now uh, fairly frequent. As I I just think of the time between. Uh, Thanksgiving and the closing of the year in, in the United States as being holiday season. A lot of people take long vacations this time of year. Um, you can't really rely on people being around. There's not a lot of light. Uh, it's just things feel like they're shutting down. And and the, the weather getting colder uh, doesn't, doesn't really help either. But uh, that's okay. I mean, it's it's not really something to mourn. It's just uh, it's just something that regularly happens, and you get used to it. Um, yeah. So health-wise, uh, I'm still dealing dealing with migraines and neuropathy and depression. But at least for the first two, I'm dealing with, uh, or I, I have a neurologist that I'm working with, and we're trying different medications and tests that will hopefully shed some light on, on these uh, questions. Um, oh, yeah, so there's one other thing that I've been meaning to talk about, and it's cultural estimation of the military. When I was younger, uh, I had a certain amount of distaste for the military. Um, I didn't really respect those who were in it. I, I had questions about the morality of potentially participating in it in the sense that when you sign up for the military you're, you're basically you're giving up a lot of your moral autonomy um, I, I mean you, you in, in a sense you're, you're still legally responsible and I think there's a legal principle in the United States that any action that's illegal uh, by by laws that the United States is subject to is by definition uh, a violation of expectations of jobs for US government employees. So if you're ever ordered to do something illegal, then that order is illegal and you would be doing something illegal to comply with it. But uh, while, while there's a complex relationship between morality and law, and I'm definitely not of the sort that says that legislating morality is a bad thing. Of course it's not. Uh, laws come from morality, they come from ethics, uh, they may be based on broad consensus and processes that are filtered versions of, uh, of the morality of uh, everybody who participates in our political system, but there is a, a tie there and there should be a tie there. It's, it's a healthy thing, it doesn't mean that it should be a right-wing or Christian thing, it's just part of uh, part of how laws work and how they should work, or at least some laws, not all laws, but um, but there's this idea that when you join the military, you're signing on for anything that the military might decide to point you at, any conflict that, uh, that the military might need to be involved in, you have signed up beforehand on that. And I found that to be kind of questionable. But on, on the other hand, in, in more recent times, I've realized states kind of need that flexibility. Uh, and it is the need to have a, a modern state, uh, one that's high function, that, can, uh, that serves its people. It, it actually can justify some things. It do, can't justify everything, but if 
if one's morality makes having a modern state impossible, then in my view, one's morality is flawed. It, uh, it, it's imperative that the way that we conceptualize our, our morals and ethics and our political consciousness, that it permits modern states with taxation, with uh, lots of government services, uh, with foreign policies, uh, and so on. Um, but I, I, but the younger me, the the one that that was uncomfortable with the idea of the military, I I was also worried about militarization of our culture. Like if if you if you read the book Starship Troopers or if you read the film, you see what a what a culture might look like that has excessive esteem of its military. And if you look at Pakistan or a few other countries maybe Turkey before the current terrible political uh, setup there. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, before the current president uh, there. Um, you, you see a glorification of force. You see excessive honors on the military, excessive uh, efforts to control public perception of the military, things like that. It's, it's not a healthy thing. And I saw a healthy disrespect for the military as being a counterbalance for that. So I, I saw this as being a, a cultural, a cultural question. Like, uh, it seemed like a good way to to balance against these overestimations by being very skeptical of the military, by being very skeptical of glorification of the military and of its members. Now that I think that there's an actual point of of having a military, now that I've come to feel that having a, a functional uh, and strong government, uh, now that I see that as being really important too, I, I find myself being pulled towards nuance. In the sense that I think I can understand why uh, Given that I think a military is necessary and helpful, I recognize that there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into the military. I, I realize that one gives up a lot of personal autonomy to perform a necessary function uh, for, for society. It's a service thing, and I, I can appreciate that as well. And, but this doesn't eliminate my, my previous concern about over-glorification of the military and the cultural uh, love of military solutions, of uh, patriotism, of other dangerous things. And so I'm, again, as I said, I'm pulled towards nuance. And I, my political stances tend to be pretty nuanced to begin with. Uh, but yeah, by, by seeing both of these, I, I have to take a stance that takes both into account. But this, this leads me to an understanding of why over-glorification, even among people who don't really want to see a military culture, and, and generally like glorification of the military is seen as being a, a right-wing tendency. Skepticism of the military is seen as being a left-wing tendency. Some of this comes down to, I think, what, what's one of the stronger understandings of left and right as cultural uh, artifacts. There's the discipline versus nurturing aspect and the military is definitely more of a discipline thing just as police uh, are more of a discipline thing while things like education and uh, and welfare programs they're more of a nurturing thing which is kind of why different things are popular among different parts of our political system but I, I think that there's a point uh, even among people who don't want to have a strictly discipline-based society, nor do they really want society to look like the military, there's still a valid point in why they would glorif uh, glorify the military based on their understanding of what it would be like to go through the military and, uh, and to serve the country in that way. And I still see that the the liberal, uh, I mean, I guess calling this a liberal perspective or a conservative perspective is misleading because there are sizable factions of each that go the opposite way or are relatively ne neutral on the topic. So maybe I shouldn't phrase it that way. But I can see both perspectives that seem to have, uh, or I can see at least two perspectives that seem to have strong 
and reasonably opposing stances on this matter. And that's, uh, it's not exactly rough, it's, it's not ex but it's not a pleasant rele revelation in the sense that, uh, a revelation, that um, it, it means that one can't uh, declare one side to be right and one side to be wrong, and I'm used to that. I think once you really take a commitment to make nuanced stances and to follow uh, where your your inner discourse and inquiry lead you, you're not going to find yourself lining up very well with party lines. And this is again why I tend to hate activists on uh, on many issues, conservative and liberal, uh, socialist and libertarian, because they tend to let their just let raw passion drive them all the way to their conclusions rather than looking for consistency, rather than thinking about legal principles and what's a workable system and what will leave society more broadly workable. They, there's, it's rare that you find activists willing to do that. They don't look at the big picture and it makes them stupid. Um, so but but yeah, so we, we we have to take a nuanced stance on this matter, and that leaves us with interesting questions of how do we put this into practice? How do we get cultural estimation of the military right? Uh, is it sustainable to push for a stance where we say it is great that individuals are willing to do this? It doesn't make everything the military does right, and it doesn't mean that the military is a guide for how society should be, but we appreciate that we uh, that we have a military, that it's strong, and that people are willing to put in the service uh, into it uh, to make it function right. I mean, that's the stance that we want to take, but it's probably a fragile stance given that there are a whole bunch of activists on uh, on the various sides that are pulling very hard towards stupid conclusions and there always will be on most issues. Uh, and generally, I mean, an unconsidered middle is stupid too. So I'm not saying that there's wisdom in the middle. Uh, I'm just saying that a lack of consideration easily leads one to stupid uh, positions, unconsidered positions, knee-jerk positions. Uh, and this is no exception uh, to, uh, to that. So, I guess more, more broadly, I, I've, I, I've also been thinking about how frustrating at times it is to, to really have a, a, to have a sense that one understands the way that things should be in some part of life. Uh, in politics, in personal life, uh, in, in a workplace, any of these realms, and probably other realms uh, as well. Uh, that if one has a vision for how how things probably should be, or at least a range of ways that things would be healthy to be in, and there's a lot of distance between that and the way things are, and one doesn't and one doesn't feel that one can actually shape the situation enough to to create progress towards the way that things should be, or at least one way that things should be. Can be really frustrating, um, like a, a vision of of a better world could be, in a sense, a, a torture, and in, in, in some ways, if one can't actually uh, can't actually bring that to being in some sense, um, and it's it probably is a character building, although perhaps a cynicism building uh, thing to be stuck in that position for too long. And, uh, but uh, this is pro uh, just a, a big part of the human condition. One, uh, one is often in this in one or more areas of life. And the thing that I hope to see in people around me, uh, when, when they have these convictions, it doesn't, incidentally, this doesn't mean that the convictions are right. It's easy to think that one sees a, a better way 
and to maybe be wrong about either the feasibility of that better way or the desirability of that better way. But, um, but to be in that position and to think that one sees something better and not to be able to move it, that's, it, it's a very common thing. And, and I, I just hope to see people not get burned out and give up uh, on, on really creating positive change and whatever ideas they have about what positive change looks like, burnout is, is probably not a healthy thing. Although maybe it is. I mean, I, I guess there's a certain degree to which uh, when there's a lot of sharply contrasting visions for whatever realm of society this is considered in, if, if there's too much difference there, then maybe having people not be as passionate as they might be can ease uh, ease functioning of of society or business or or social circles, uh, things like that. I mean, too much passion, uh, too too concrete an idea of what the, what the good looks like, and too little flexibility on on cooperating with others whose vision differs. That would be destructive as well. Um, I guess there's a certain tension there, and there isn't even necessarily given. Uh, there isn't even necessarily a a good answer as to whether it's a production, a productive uh, tension or not. Oh, well, something to think about. Um, so coming up, there's uh, not a lot that I have scheduled for December. I don't think I'm traveling, although I'm kind of tempted to travel to Pittsburgh or maybe some other city just to see the turning of the year, although maybe I'll find something nice in New York City uh, to do. Uh, Pittsburgh had, has wonderful traditions for the turning of the year. They call it first night. I think some other cities might do that kind of thing too. Maybe I'll head up to Boston for that, or maybe I'll I, I don't know. I guess it's probably about time that I, if I'm going to do something, it makes time for me to, it, it's it's probably time for me to actually make the plans because it's about a month from now and airplane tickets get expensive. Um, there's a uh, skeptic camp coming up, which I'm looking forward to. It's a yearly function where the uh, secular community in New York City has a one day uh, unconference which is kind of nice. Um, otherwise, yeah, I don't think I really have much planned. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm going to sign off uh, now since it's late and I had a long migraine earlier today and I probably should uh, get some rest. Hopefully so I'll be uh, not too burned out tomorrow. Um, and, uh, I guess, not sure when I'll do the next one of these, but as always, I'm, I'm always hoping that I'll feel inspired and, uh, interested to do, uh, to do another one soon. Oh yeah, and, and I'm, I am looking forward to the, the Nexus 6 coming out, having a nicer camera and a fresh battery in my cell phone would be nice, but, I mean, that, it doesn't change my life all that much. I am realizing that having a Chromebook means that I don't program as casually as I used to because not having a compiler on your on the computer that you carry around all the time turns out that that's just one of those little incentive barriers and there are a lot of incentive barriers where needing to SSH somewhere to to program it just means it's a little bit more hassle and it means that I don't program nearly as often so I probably need to get a new laptop as well sometime soon, but I'm wary of all of the hardware purchases that it looks like are on the horizon. I don't want to uh, exhaust my financial resources, and I probably should be saving more anyhow. Um, and yeah, I, I keep on thinking that I probably should be moving a little bit, a uh, little bit closer to the city, but I guess my the turning of the year is coming up, and I doubt that I'm I would. I'm doubting that I'll find a new apartment by the end of December. Uh, that would be a, a little weird. Plus, there's the nice thing about my current apartment, that it's very affordable. 
And while I'm still trying to build up a, a bigger financial cushion, it makes sense probably to stay here for one more year and then decide uh, where in New York I'd like to uh, live next. Um, yep, so that's it. Um, if Again, if you have comments, I'll try and respond to them. Hopefully I'll notice. I'm not entirely certain whether uh, YouTube is still notifying me when uh, there are comments on my videos, but uh, that's it.